the new pavilion behind the basketball courts. Uh, we would appreciate a head count to be sure we have sufficient fried chicken and cake. And if you are inclined to bring a favorite dish, which we're asking people to do, um, bring that with you, please. I'll have a registration slip at the back on the heater. And if you could sign that if you're coming and how many people might be with you, I need to know that. Our community blood drive will be July the 6th, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the social hall at the Thermont United, United Methodist Church. Our school supply drive, uh, we still need to bring in school supplies and what we do we usually have a table out here where we put them on, right? Will you do that again, Ross? Yeah. Okay, so if, if you see a school supply of anything when you're in the store, buy it and bring it in and we will have something ready for kids in the fall. Are there any joys and concerns? Um, maybe you have an update on Frank Valentine share with us. Uh, I mean, my understanding is Frank had pneumonia and COVID both and was in the you hospital. Mean Frankie. Yeah, Frankie. Frank. Sorry. Um, I haven't heard anything within the last couple of days. Um, his brother said that he really had a terrible, terrible pneumonia and COVID and they thought they, they had lost him. Um, that's how bad he'd gotten but he is doing better, and I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure he's home, but I think he's probably going to have quite a while getting, getting better with all they're getting. And um, my son-in-law, Brian Sespo, will start chemotherapy on June the 26th, so please keep him in your prayers. And... Um, I have one other thing, I'm going off the rail today. Uh, several years ago, when I would do the services, I spoke of the medical field and Christianity in the medical field. And in that talk that day, I told you about working with Dr. Ben Carson. The, um, the man had come to see a child with a brain injury at Washington County Hospital. He came in, looked at the child, he flew in, the helicopter came in, he said he could not do that surgery in Hagerstown, so he was flying the baby back to John Hopkins to do brain surgery. When he did, he said, I have to get this baby now to Hopkins, but he said before that, we're all going to hold hands and give a prayer for the love of this child and that we can get him better. So the other night I'm watching TV and by accident I get a channel in the 900s and it's the story of Ben Carson. And I cried the whole time. <laughs> Larry's like, um, it was magnificent. So if you ever get a chance to read a little bit about him, he was an amazing man, and when he was doing the conjoining twin surgery in their brain, he had to separate them, and the, somebody said to him, and what are you going to do now? And he said, pray. And the, the guy said, you're going to pray? And he said, I pray every morning and every evening. The, ho the whole show just did me in. Anyway, just wanted to say that. Um, please join me now in our call to worship. It is good to give God thanks, to sing praises to the Most High. We will sing for joy to God who has made us land. Let us declare God's steadfast love in this morning. So come to worship God with thankful, joyful hearts. Let us praise God's holy name together. The proof of 
God's amazing love is this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Living God, as we watch our gardens and our children Christ and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and set free by God's gracious, generous grace. Rejoice in God's good gift. Amen. Let us join in our hymn of praise number 526, Faith of Our Thank you. chapter 17 verses 22 through 24. In this passage the Lord announces taking a sprig from a lofty cedar. God then plants it on a high mountain exalting it. God's care for the tender shoot speaks about God's ability to bring life amid devastation from the most unlikely places. The Lord God proclaims I myself will take one of the top branches from the tall cedar. I will pluck a tender shoot from its crown, and I myself will plant it on a very high and lofty mountain. On Israel's mountainous highlands I will plant it, and it will send out branches and bear fruit. It will grow to a mighty cedar, 
Birds of every kind will rest in it and find shelter in the shade of its boughs. Then all the trees in the countryside will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and raise up the lowly tree and make the green tree wither and the dry tree bloom. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. The Gospel lesson for this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. Mark chapter 4 verses 26 through 34. In this passage, Jesus continues to give the crowds examples of how God's growing kingdom works. One of the insights is that we do work to help grow the kingdom, but God is the one who is actually behind all that happens and supports all growth. Hear the word of the Lord. Then Jesus said, this is what God's kingdom is like. It is as though someone scatters seed on the ground. Then sleeps and wakes night and day. The seed sprouts and grows, but the farmer doesn't know how. The earth produces crops all by itself. First the stalk, then the head, then the full head of grain. Whenever the crop is ready, the farmer goes out to cut the grain because it's harvest time. He continued. What's a good image for God's kingdom? What parable can I use to explain it? Consider a mustard seed. When scattered on the ground, it's the smallest of all seeds on the earth. But when it's planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all vegetable plants. It produces such large branches that the birds in the sky are able to nest in its shade. With many such parables, he continued to give them the word as much as they were able to hear. He spoke to them only in parables, then explained everything to his disciples when he was alone with them. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Okay, first I want to start out with this little story, which uh, has absolutely nothing to do with Father's Day. When you sent three delegates to our association meeting in the spring, which was wonderful. We had a chance to fellowship together and sit together, and uh, I was there in the pew, Ross was beside me, Sue was beside him, and Linda was on the, uh, down toward the end there, beside Sue. So as we were going through the business of the association, we came to a point where we had election of committee members and committee officers. But we found that for the uh, association council, which is basically like the association consistory, in a way, the governing body, we still needed two members at large, and we had no nominations for them. So, when they asked for nominations from the floor, of course, people were really not jumping up and down to, uh, you know, take those two slots. So I looked at Ross and I said, you want one of those slots? Are you interested at all? And he said, nope, not interested. I said, well, yes, Sue. So he leaned over and said, Sue, Jeff wants to know if you're interested in, in this slot. Sue said, nope, not interested in that slot. I said, well, ask Linda. So Sue bent over and said, Linda. And Linda said, what? And Sue said, would you like to serve on the committee? And Linda sort of bent over and said, well, what would I have to do? Immediately, I put my hand up and said, I have a nomination to fill this slot. And actually, I interrupted the president. And he said, well, maybe we could wait a little bit for that. I said, well, OK, but I don't know. I have a nomination. <laughs> So, I nominated Linda, and he kindly asked her if she would accept, which I didn't ask her, <laughs> and, uh, and she did. So now, you are, represented, you are represented by a member at large on our council, and Linda attended the first meeting last month, and she's going to attend the second meeting on Monday, and that's just wonderful. So, if you want some direct input in the talk association, Council, there she is. All right, so that's great, right? Okay. All right, we got that out of the way. I've been wanting to tell that story ever since the meeting. Uh, Still so 
thank you for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, she still talked to me. I just wanted to point that out. So, Okay. Well, let's get back to the business at hand. This is an odd way to start out a sermon, I think, but I'm going to do it anyway. You know, I don't like preaching on Mother's Day and Father's Day. I just have to tell you. Or maybe I should say I've grown to not like it. Uh, as time goes on in my ministry, which this year will be a ministry of 44 years, I find that there are too many issues, too many possibilities, too many ways to stumble when you start talking about things like mothers and fathers, because our ideas about this have changed so much over the decades. And yet each year, I rise to the challenge, I preach it anyway, because I hate to be challenged with something and then just ignore it. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think some preachers just gloss over this. <laughs> and go with it, but let's help me struggle with this a little bit today. So here we go again. So I'm going to begin with a little bit of historic background. Our nation's first Father's Day was actually celebrated on June 19th of 1910 in the state of Washington. And actually, it was the state of Washington that first instituted Father's Day. But it wasn't until 1972 58 years later, after President Woodrow Wilson had made Mother's Day an official holiday, the day honoring fathers became a nationwide holiday in the United States. I think it was Richard Nixon that actually pushed that. 58 years after Mother's Day. The man who initially inspired Father's Day was a single dad and a Civil War vet. Believe you, I don't know why. His name was William Jackson Smart. He was married twice, widowed twice, and he was the father of 14 children. So, he was the original inspiration. Of course, Father's Day has always played second fiddle to Mother's Day, mostly because it was seen to have far less commercial value. Fathers have the same sentimental appeal that mothers have, it was said. And so, we focused on where we can make more money off of mothers. In addition to this, in the early stages, men were often viewed as the ones who worked outside the home, brought financial resources into the home. So fathers complained that Father's Day was just a celebration that they didn't really want, but they ultimately had to pay for. <laughs> so that didn't help. How times have changed. Last year, 2023, Americans spent $35.7 billion on, for their mothers on Mother's Day. Imagine that. But only $22.9 billion were spent on Father's Day. That's still a lot of money, though, isn't it? This may be changing slightly, as this year, 2024, only $33.5 billion was spent on Mother's Day, down $2.2 billion from last year. And, of course, today's Father's Day, so the jury's out still on how much was spent on Father's this year. Today... Our day of honoring fathers in the United States is celebrated on the third Sunday of June, which is where we are today. Interestingly, though, it is celebrated in other countries, but especially in Europe and Latin America, fathers are honored on St. Joseph's Day, a traditional Catholic holiday honoring the earthly father of Jesus, and that always falls on March the 19th. So, there are other Father's Days, but they aren't celebrated necessarily at the same time. However, I do believe Canada celebrates it on the same day that we do. You know, there was a time, or I, even I can remember this, there was a time when preaching on a celebration like Father's Day was a lot easier to do. 
Back in the 50s and 60s, dads portrayed on TV <laughs> tended to be serious, calm, wise, and a bit detached. Leave it to Beaver. My three sons, father knows best. When we think about the Andy Griffith Show, though, we have moved into a single parent idea. Of course, Andy was always helped a lot by Aunt B and Barney, sometimes Gomer and Goober, and I guess Helen was in there a little bit too. So Opie had a lot of parenting, but only one biological parent uh, alive. In later decades, though, in terms of the media in this country, fathers start to become more foolish and incompetent, like with cartoons like The Simpsons or King of the Hill. A little bit different take on fathers. The real world roles and expectations of fathers have changed even more in recent years. Today, dads are putting on more time, putting more time into caring for their children, and they see that role as more essential to their identity. More dads are portrayed in the media as single parents. Uh, they are portrayed as being emotionally invested in more than just bringing home the bacon. They are stakeholders in the child's rearing process. But this whole gender role thing has become blurred in the past couple decades. Even the definition of father has changed. A father is seen as much more than a man who has sired a child. And that's where this whole thing about preaching about Father's Day starts to get, for me at least, more complicated. The reality of dealing with Father's Day is the problem that preachers and others face. Um, it's no longer a simple task to deal with the concept of Father's and what that really means to family. At one time, it was simple. You just pointed out what fathers allegedly do for their children that goes unnoticed, complimented them on their new tie, and then you read a poem or a saying that went something like this one. God took the strength of a mountain, the majesty of a tree, the warmth of a summer sun, the calm of a quiet sea, the generous soul of nature, the comforting arm of night, the wisdom of the ages, the power of the eagle's flight, the joy of a morning in spring, the faith of a mustard seed, the patience of eternity, the depth of a family need. Then God combined these qualities. When there was nothing more to add, he knew his masterpiece was complete, and so he called it dad. Well, that's nice, isn't it? It's just wonderful. I wish I could stop the sermon right there because that makes it easy. But that is not the reality of fathering. So let's take a look at the reality. The Bible pushes us in certain directions regarding respect for parents. Commandment number five of the Ten Commandments says, can you guess? Yes. Honor thy father and thy mother that they your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. Yep, number five. Jesus takes this idea and turns it on its head by saying in Matthew 23, 9, And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Hmm. Well, that's sort of the opposite extreme. The Bible gives us examples of good fathers, like Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. The father in this story is very faithful to his children and does what he should do to support them when they make good decisions and when they make poor decisions. Then there is the story of Jairus, a father who desperately seeks Jesus' help to heal his daughter. This is a wonderful story because in antiquity, a lot of times the fathers were not as concerned about their daughters. They were much more concerned about their sons. But this man, Jairus, was very concerned about his daughter, and he pleaded with Jesus to come and heal her. And, of course, Jesus did it. It's a wonderful story of good fathering. 
but there are other accounts of fathers that are not so good. And I'm not, it would take all day to go through them all, but here's one that you're probably aware of, but maybe aren't really thinking about the details. There is someone in the Old Testament that we often call father. Who is that? There's a little song about it. No, actually, no. Moses was more on the leader side. Abraham. Father Abraham, right? Father Abraham has many sons. I don't know what happened to the daughters of Abraham. But there's a little song, right? And we sing in Bible school and all this kind of thing, right? Well, let's think about Abraham. He was the father of many nations, right? That's what the angels promised him. And so forth, not just nations, but you know, we got to start somewhere. So children as well. But let's take a look at his track record as father. First, we start out with the idea that Abraham can't have a child with his wife, Sarah. So instead, he has a child with his wife's slave, Hagar. That child's name is Ishmael, thank you. And you know, Abraham loves him. And Abraham is a, seems to be a very good dad to him. Does a lot of things with him. You know, teaches him many, many things and so on and so forth. But after 10 or 12 years, all of a sudden Sarah gets pregnant. Now, I'm not going to go into that whole story, but she has a son, and that son's name is Isaac. Abraham loves Ishmael, but Sarah had this son, Isaac. So ultimately, what is Abraham's response to the birth of Isaac? He sends Ishmael and his mom into the desert to die. Fortunately, God saves them. Another story. So now, back to Isaac. Isaac now, according to the scripture, is continually called the only son of Abraham. Even though he has another son, Ishmael, who's still alive. And is still out there. And actually, he's doing pretty well. So, not only now does Isaac have this one older brother who's still alive, but check this out. Abraham gets another wife, and her name is Keturah. And he has six sons to this wife. Did you remember that from the story? No, because no one ever remembers that because the Bible keeps telling us that Isaac is his only son. He has six sons to another wife. I don't know what in the world he does with those sons because we never find out. All we know is that he keeps on with Isaac. But then he takes this Isaac, who is his only son, drags him up on a mountain, and gets ready to kill him to sacrifice to God. Once again, God intervenes, what does he do with Ishmael, and saves Isaac's life. What kind of a father is this Abraham? Now I know you're going to tell me, but he was following God's orders, and that's the whole point of the story. I'm not really talking about that right now. I'm talking about father. In the end, when Abraham dies, and he's buried. Only two sons are there. Isaac is there, and Ishmael comes back. And the two are there together for their father's birth. The other six sons, uh, I guess they couldn't handle it. So they weren't there. The Hebrew scriptures are full of stories about good and bad fathers. And so is life. Today we recognize that not all fathers are good. Not all fathers treat their families properly. Fathers still abandon their children. Some children do not know who their fathers are. And some men cannot or choose not 
to become fathers. So here's where the real work begins as we talk about a day like Father's Day. We try to be sensitive to these situations when celebrating a holiday like this in the church. And we attempt to address the reality of fathering. It's not an easy task. You can't just tie a bow on it to say, here, have an outfield group. First of all, though, and we'll do something, and we are going to feel good about some things. So first of all, we should recognize and celebrate what faithful fathers do every day for their families. There is absolutely nothing wrong with this. We should also recognize that not all people who act as good fathers are actually biological fathers. We used to assign roles to fathers and different roles to mothers. That may still be the case in certain circumstances, but now we talk more about parenting than actual gender-specific roles. Some families are single-parent families with no male parent. Others have two female parents or two male parents. And there are other possibilities as well. Many grandparents act as parents for one reason or another. And honestly, to be fair, we should have done away with Mother's Day and Father's Day and just made a Parents' Day. I mean, we have a President's Day, right? And actually, believe this or not, it's been suggested a number of times that we move to this idea of just acknowledging parents, you know, which it would be a good thing. But personally, I doubt if that will ever happen because retailers would lose money, and Hallmark would only sell half the cards. So, probably we won't see it. So we still have the dilemma. I'm going to draw this to a close, but think about these things. Whoever you call father or parent, the Bible does give us Examples of good parenting. Here are some general examples offered from Scripture. A parent, father, should express God's, uh, impress God's commands upon their children. The one who loves, uh, the Bible says the one who loves their children is careful to, interestingly, discipline them. Fathers encourage and comfort their children, the Bible says. Your faith will be a refuge for your children. Another quote from Proverbs. And yet another one from Proverbs. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. For I give you sound teaching. Do not abandon my directive. And another admonition to fathers. Do not embitter your children. A father should never take away his life. These are good guidelines to follow. In these days with so many possibilities and issues, good parenting still exists. And thanking a good parent, a good father, for all that they have done for us is extremely important. So whoever your father or parent figure is, Father's Day is a good time to reach out in love and say thanks. <clears throat> and now, oh, there it is. You know, it's difficult work being a good father, but the concept may not be as challenging as it first seems. Listening, understanding, empathy cost very little and often are all our children really want and need from us emotionally. The American writer, poet, cartoonist, singer-songwriter, musician, and playwright, Shel Silverstein. Maybe many of you have read his works for adults and children. Has put together uh, just a little poem. And I'd actually like to conclude the sermon with a poem 
which I think is a little more relevant than maybe the first one that I read. This one is about an old man who is acting, in my mind, as a father to a little boy. Probably isn't his father, could be his grandfather, could just be a father figure. He listens to that, what that boy has to say, and he resonates with him as they both try to understand and embrace where they are on life's journey. To me, this poem is quite touching. You may or may not feel the same, but I would like you to think about it with me. So here's the little poem. It's called The Little Boy and the Old Man. Said the little boy, I sometimes drop my spoon. Said the little old man, I do that too. The little boy whispered, I wet my pants. I do too, left the little old man. Said the little boy, I often cry. The old man nodded. So do I. But worst of all, said the little boy, it seems grown-ups don't pay attention to me. And he felt the warmth of a wrinkled old hand. I know what you mean, said the little old man. The best father is one who understands. Happy Father's Day. Gracious God, you hold all things in your hands. We may plant seeds, but it is in your mysterious power that brings forth growth. We play our small parts, but you awaken new life. Thank you for our place in your purposes. Guide our plans for ministry in the days ahead. Plant seeds of your kingdom in our midst. On this day that celebrates fathers, we pray for families in war torn communities where celebration is an impossible dream. We pray for fathers and families who face financial hardship and worry for the well being of their children. We pray for any who face financial hardship and worry all the time. We, the, we pray for those who feel empty or lonely this day, who fear the future or mourn the past. Summer holidays draw closer, guide families to find meaningful opportunities to enjoy each other and the world on their doorsteps. Gracious God, you hold all things in your hand, including us. Be with all those who carry on in spite of loss or grief, with all those who face pain or uncertainty about their future. Keep us open to your spirit's leading in all that we do with and for each other. Help us embody the love of our Lord Jesus Christ who taught us to pray and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not on temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the Lord. The parables of St. Mark remind us that God's kingdom grows from small beginnings with surprising results. So give to God as you are able, and trust that God will honor your generosity for the purposes of God's spirit at work among us and beyond us. Let us give of our tithes and our offerings.
pray for you. Use them as seeds of new life in our community and in your world. Grow results we cannot even imagine within us, among us, because of us, and beyond us. For the sake of Christ our living God, Please join with me in our closing hymn number six, This Is My Father's World.